Yeah. So thanks for coming. Coming everybody. Uh, uh, can you ask me to make sure everybody is asleep by the end of my talk so they will rest if I can stop? So we have this afternoon slot. They're really great. So yeah. So what I want to want to talk about is, is the stuff I've been concerned with for the last three years or so. We we start looking into hardware trojans and. The deeper we get into it, we really feel it's something super dangerous and it's maybe not very well investigated by, by our community here. So, um, you know, if German professors do great things, it's usually the PhD students and postdoc, right? So it's most of the stuff I'm going to show you is, you know, was, was, was work done by Georg, Pavel and Mark. Um, what I want to talk about today, first I want to give you a little bit an introduction about hardware Trojans and also where we can put that within our academic field. And then really there's three main parts of my talk. I want to talk about subtransistor Trojans, FPGA tro Trojans, and then also key extraction attacks. Um, so let's talk about hardware Trojan, like an introduction to that, right? So what the hardware Trojan is kind of self-explaining, right? You have some kind of hardware circuit and you add some unwanted functionality, right? So you typically malicious manipulation, right? You do something with the circuits that was not intended. So why would anybody be interested in that? And there's a whole bunch of applications, right, for that. Um, a big driving force, as we're going to see in the next few slides, is the US military. So they're really scared that people do something through their integrated circuits that run their drones, right? I mean, the classical example is you have a beautiful drone you know, which you can buy for whatever, $20 million, right? And it works beautifully as long as you're not over China, right? If the GPS chip sees the GPS coordinates are in China, it stops working, right? But maybe closer to home, from a European perspective, is also critical infrastructure, you know, smart grid and so forth. They all run on digital technology nowadays, right? This is not done with big power switches that you manipulate manually, so there's a uh, uh, electronic digital control network behind that and it can be quite attractive for whoever builds these power chips to remotely control them and switch all, all the lights in Switzerland and Germany or wherever else, right, remotely. But also we can probably come up with pretty interesting uh, attack scenarios where you uh, people start manipulating, for instance, the baseband chips in, in, in uh, Android or um, Apple smartphones. So where are we with this topic? And I think it's pretty dangerous, right? So where are we with, topic, with this topic? So first of all, as um, uh, Jean-Pierre mentioned before, I've, I started doing hardware security in 1995, right? Until 2005, I've never even heard the term hardware trojans, right? What is that? So nobody cared about it. And then in 2005, there was a, uh, this report by the Defense Science Board on high-performance microchip supply. And the, the, the picture that they painted, maybe rightly so, even though that's somewhat um, debatable, they said the problem is that 90 plus percent of, of our microchips, of the US microchips, but also the European microchips, are not being manufactured in the US and Europe, but in the Far East, right? In, in, in Taiwan, China, and so forth, right? And so they are, they, they are scared about exactly the tech scenario I, um, I mentioned before, that they are, that they are manipulated to manufacture. So, Typical US thing, so they started with that, and then there was a DARPA call in this topic. And what you see here is the number of publications dealing with hardware trojans, right? So the blue lines are the papers that actually have hardware trojans in the title, the red line is that deal with hardware trojans in the context, right? So this has gone up pretty nice linearly over the years, right? Uh, so that's kind of an interesting thing that's happened. And again, prior to that, there was apparent apparently nobody caring about it and probably became kind of a, I don't know, a sexy topic, but a some, somewhat popular topic in the hardware security community. Mm -hmm. So, before we go deeper into that, it might be interesting to look at these attack scenarios. So one attack scenario I mentioned before, so this is actually doing manufacturing, and there's some debate about that, how realistic that is. If, 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 if you know the details about the LSI manufacturing, it's not quite that easy if you get your 500 million transistor chip and you don't, you don't know anything about the chip, right? And identifying the GPS module and modifying it in, in, in a meaning, meaningful way from an adversary point of view so that the legitimate owner doesn't notice that. This is not a particularly easy task necessarily, okay? But this is one text scenario. 
maybe more likely is if you look at your the main chip that runs my iPhone or, or an Android phone, they consist of something between 100 and 200 so-called IP blocks. You can think about that as like a software module, right? A software function, which are not designed by Apple. They buy it from different manufacturers. So, and this is actually a very interesting research problem. If you have a hostile IP core, you know, running next to your ARM processor, can this hostile IP core, which is maybe your, your Bluetooth module, right? Can this steal crypto keys running on your ARM processor? This is a typical question, right? Another scenario is one much simpler. Card with Trojans are introduced during shipments. It means people open up the boxes of your, of your Cisco router, take the soldering iron and flip chips, right? This is another attack scenario. Or the easiest, built-in vectors, okay? So who are the people, who, well, potentially the people behind that? Well, here, you know, the defense science for of US said, yeah, this is like, the Chinese, right, or the Germans, or the Swiss, right, you know, the chip manufacturer, they're the bad guys, right? And again, all of that is not particularly clear how realistic that is. What we do know, thanks to Snowden, these are very realistic threats coming out from the US government, right? So it's kind of an ironic situation that here the US government says, oh, we have to protect against hardware Snowden, uh, hardware frozen, and by the way, we are also the people that put in other people's hardware, right? And, and this is not science fiction if you go to the you know Wikipedia, right? If you go to the Wikipedia page and you type in NSA, you get the NSA page. This picture is on the Wikipedia NSA, people people opening up boxes and flipping chips, right? And there's even an NSA term, they call it interdiction, right? So this is real. Okay, so it's kind of interesting. So, yeah, yeah right. I, 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 it was a little bit political, but now let's look where are we as a scientist. We know, for instance, from the soft, so we, now we want to study hardware protection, right? And a lot of people do that in the software case, and there are plenty of examples of that, right? If you talk about is, is the good, good uh, antivirus people, right? They have yeah, these absurd numbers, right? 50,000 neutrons released per day. Sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. I'm sorry, there is the mics over there, so. <laughs> I like running around, okay. <laughs> You're good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Pe people know me, okay, so. <laughs> It's hard to ground me. Okay, yeah, <laughs> Gr ground for life. So what I, what I was saying, um, you know, the software case is these, these absurd numbers, right? Twenty-five thousand software trojans released per day. I think what they really mean, like variants of, of viruses, right? Well, in, where are we in in in, in the um, in the hardware case? We're down to zero. There has not been a single confirmed case of like a real hardware trojan that was been observed. I'm sure that has happened in the past, that has not been reported. And now do we have Swiss people in the room here? Who, who knows Crypto AG? Yeah. Go to Wikipedia, right? 1980s, that was a very interesting story. Good, okay. So it has happened in, in, in the past. So this is also what historically been called a backdoor, right? This is kind of the fancy term, it's not hard for children, right? They're examples, but they are, you know, people like my bachelor students or master students, they built in a Trojan in their homemade uh, AES implementation, they introduced a Trojan. This, and the question is, is this representative for what the NSA wants to do? Probably not, right? So, but then there have been these hundreds and hundreds of publications. Well, 95, 98% deal with detection. And I think there's our community, you know, the hardware security community, it's kind of a little bit uh, off whack here. So they try to detect something where we haven't seen a sim single, single real-world instance, right? So, so th this is where, uh, you know, the first kind of research results come in. So um, Georg and I, we sat down a few years ago and said, well, rather than only detecting Trojans, and by the way, we don't really know how they're going to look, what about designing Trojans? In designing like your standard hardware Trojans is easy depending on the tech scenario. In particular, if you're the manufacturer and you have total control of your VLSI design, of course it's easy to add some kind of key leakage circuit in the crypto case, right? So we wanted to make it harder and more interesting and more publishable, right? So we, we, we uh, added this boundary condition. We wanted to add hardware Trojans that are really hard to detect. In other words, with like the smallest possible alterations to the circuit, right? We start with something very simple, CMOS inverter, right? So this is, this is a really complicated truth table, <laughs> two transistors, right? Zero, one, one, zero. We've seen that before, right? 
So, and what we are focusing and what we want to achieve is something like that, so that the inverter doesn't really function as an inverter, but a constant output here. And of course, you can do something like that. You could just, you know, shortcut the transistor, but if you do then the VLSI I circuit, you can detect that it's actually not that difficult to um, delay our circuit and look at that with a standard microscope. Essentially, sandpaper, right? 200 sandpaper, right? You do then, you take photos, you can do that. So the question is, are there more sneaky ways to do that? So it's almost impossible to see that we change this inverter to this constant output here. What we're going to do, we're going to look at this transistor. Okay. So this is how a transistor looks um, uh, from the side. You have this uh, you know, source drain and gate. Most of you have seen that at some point, right? Um, and this is not to scale. This is blown up, right? So in reality, we talk about 22 nanometers. This is 22 nanometers, right? This is, this is what is it? 18 centimeters, right? So, a factor 1 million or something, 1 billion enlarged, right? So, what we do instead of this P doping, you know, and P doping means you add a few atoms to that, right? With, 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 with a different uh, physical characteristic, we do N doping. Is that a problem? No, because in CMOS, exactly 50% of your transistors are N doped anyway. So, the only thing that we're doing, we take a P MOS transistor, do an N doping. So if you do that, this is not working as a gate anymore, but as a closed circuit, right? So if you do that, um, you get a permanently closed transistor, and you can do a similar trick with the NBOS transistor, so it's permanently open, right? So, and then we get this functionality here, right? And the idea is, the underlying idea, this is really hard to see, because, what did we do here? We literally fiddled around with the atoms, right? And of course, the atoms, they're not orange and green, right? You cannot see them in the real world, right? So, and there's a really low concentration. There's like one out of a, Paul, what is it, one in a million? It's like one in a million atoms literally are like this p doped atoms, almost all the same, right? So it's really hard. You cannot see that at one point. So now the, 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 the remaining two questions is, can this manipulation be detected? You know, that's the question. Can we see the, the changes in doping? And one, if, if that cannot be detected, can we build useful trojans from that? OK. So question to the audience. So this is something similar to what you may see. Which of these two inverters has a trojan? Can anybody tell me? No. We're using the same picture. <laughs> so this is a joke, right? Because you know the doping would be kind of from the back side. You will not be able to see that, right? You know, I'm, I'm going to talk that in um, in a little while about you know how, how people can seriously maybe detect that, right? So they look essentially all the standard methods for detection, and again there have been hundreds and hundreds of paper. All the detection methods will fail here in this case, right? So the to be honest, the, 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 the more interesting, the small remaining questions is what we did from a VLSI point of view, the background in, in, in VLSI design, this is something really simple and, and actually quite stupid that we did, right? We had a CMOS inverter and we introduced what's called a stuck at fault, right? We stuck, we stuck this inverter as a permanent one output. This is not very sophisticated, right? So, and in particular, if you do that after functional testing, this fault will be detected and the chip will be thrown out, right? So the question is, can we build a meaningful, and now meaningful, uh, you know, we, we, we argue from, 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 the, from the bad side, right? From the NSA type of, 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 of uh, perspective, right? Can we build a meaningful Trojan under this, uh, um, uh, uh, under this setup, right? And luckily, we come back to Napier's talks. This is really perfect. Um, we look at two random number generators. Two random number generators and, 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 and there are reasons to believe that this is something that the intelligence agency always love to manipulate and looking at the dual ERC, there's some confirmation for that. So, some of you might know, some of you might not, not know. In all the modern Intel CPUs, there's a true random number generator inside, right? Uh, why do we need that? Well, you can use it for all kinds of simulation type of things, but in particular, it's used for crypto, right? For e-banking, for email encryption, for digital signing, all the stuff that is really interesting also for attackers, right? This is exactly where you use your TRNG here, right? And the basic idea is that we introduce the dope and Trojans in our true random number generator, and there's a disclaimer at this moment. 
So this is not only working against the Intel TRNG, but Intel is great because the, the, the poor engineer, the hardware engineer that published his design for the TRNG, so we know exactly how Intel implemented that. So it's very nice that Natya introduced this principle before all modern two random number generators, even in hardware, follow the same design principle that Natya uh, showed before. There's an entropy source, and this is what they call digital pulse processing, which is typically in Natya's talk, which was like SHA-1 or something like that here, right? So you need an entropy source. And how does it work? So you get an entropy source, which is some kind of analog type of circuit deep hidden inside your Intel chip, and here you have uh, some kind of hash function running, right? And then the output is typically a crypto key, for instance, for AS with 128 bits. Um, so how do the details look? Interestingly, we're not touching the entropy source. This is some kind of weird ring oscillator analog. We're not touching that, right? So we try to manipulate the, this is the whole digital pro pulse processing. They are not using a dedicated hash function. What they do, they use AS and run it as a hash function, right? And the design itself is very sound. So there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with the crypto people at Intel that is something stupid. So what they do is the entropy source fills both the key register but also the regular input register with random high entropy zeros and ones. And then in it, and um, then what you can and then you query the crypto key. And if you query crypto key relatively slowly, let's say every one milliseconds, you fill that up. But if you start querying the crypto, if you pull a lot of crypto keys, you know, maybe in, 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 in every microsecond or something like that, in additionally, you can just incre uh, um, increment that so you run that in counter mode. This is a sound design here. There's nothing wrong with that, right? You essentially run that in a stream cipherish mode here, right? Some, somewhat like a counter mode here. Um, so what is the entropy here? If you want to attack that baby, well, unfortunately, you have two, two registers, 128 <coughs> bit each. That means the overall entropy or unknownness that you f uh, feed into AS is 256 bits. Enjoy if you, if you want to brute force that, right? It's 256, it's lifetime of the universe, blah, 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 blah. You cannot do that. So what do we do with our attack? Something quite simple here. What we're going to do is we're going to fix <coughs> most of these state registers to fixed values, and rather that they accept random bits coming from the entropy source 0 and 1, we fix them to fixed values. These are the red ones. So this first bit is set by 0 by us. How do we do that? By doing the stopping consideration change, right? So we force it to. Uh, we could do all of that. We could do all of them, right? But then we would be kind of stuck with the crypto key. So what we do is, in this example, we leave 32 flip propositions here intact, so this actually is being filled with randomness, meaning we can still, from a you know operational point of view, you get about you, you get uh, two to the 32, which is about one billion possible crypto keys. That means you can initiate a lot of SSL sessions and always have fresh key material, right? And if SAS is secure, it will be really hard to detect this thing, right? Um, and now we drove the thing even further, namely, if you do that, the, all, these, uh, all these circuits in modern VLSI design, they of course test it, right? They test it. So now we must make sure that, the that this circuit uh, survives the testing. And this is, <coughs> if you don't like hardware design, go to sleep for the next two minutes, right? The next slide is kind of hard wave, right? So namely, I'm, I'm going to talk about roughly how modern hardware testing works, right? They have built in self-test, and what they do is, is, it's not that complicated. So this is how it's supposed to work, and what they do, they feed known input to that, and they clock that a few times, and they look at this 512 output. Bits. And if everything is okay, if this is known input is deterministic, of course there should be 512 deterministic bits, and they should look quite random, right? AES is a good pseudo-random number generator. So what we did, we fiddled around with AES, remember, right? So we have now a Trojan-infested AES implementation here. So obviously these, these 512 bits are totally different from these 512 bits, right? So and normally that, that chip with our Trojan would, be, would go into the trash can, right? It's the end of the conveyor belt, right, in Taiwan. But this is not what you learn in VLSI 101, right? Namely, because it's a pain 
to compare these 512 bits. So what they do, they run a CSC checksum, so they do a data compression, okay. and they compress it to 32 bits, and then you have a much shorter reference checksum. Why is it? Because it's much faster and cheaper, right? This is built in self-test. I took a master's class 25 years ago in VLS eye testing. We learned that stuff, right? So this is real. So what we did cleverly, right? So we made sure, because we can, um, we made sure that these 32 bits match these 32 bits here at this point, right? And this works because these Trojan bits, what are the Trojan bits? I'm going back one slide. Here we have, we can, you know, these 224 bits, we have total freedom how to choose them. And because we control the key, we can compute backwards here, right? We can go backwards. So, so you know, it's pretty basic. So we fix this 224 bits such that these 512, we can make, make them equal, so they're different. But we can make sure once the CFC compressed, which is a linear operation, these 32 bits are the same. So yeah. you suppose there's only one input? that they don't try with two different things. No, no, the, yeah, yeah, and this is testing. This is hardwired in, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, okay. good, good point, yeah, yeah. But this, you know, and, and again, this is functional testing. This is not testing with respect to attackers, but this is good point, yeah. Okay, so. Can I ask you a quick question, too? Yeah, sure. So it seems a little, I always thought it was a little wonky that they use AS for their extractor, extraction step, the post-processing step. So if they used a one-way hash function, like a shot, It would be harder for us, yeah, it would be harder to us, for us. Yeah, yeah, you have to look into that, yeah. Yeah. yeah, right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. But again, what we're doing here is also, this is only necessary if Intel is not in bed with the NSA, right? If yeah. Intel is in bed with the NSA, they know that they fiddle around and they get incorrect. Right. So, yeah. But it's a good point, good point, yeah. So, what is the conclusion from this attack? Well, you know, we get excellent press here, right? Actually, the, <laughs> the, the chess community. <laughs> Thought it was a nice paper, but it was everything, you know. I, I, I told Georg that should be best paper award. People thought it's a nice paper, but they didn't care, right? But then it took, I think, two weeks, and Slashdot picked it up, and it was a few years after Edward Snowden, as the whole thing exploded, right? We were Spiegel, we got Schneier, right? We were in the in the Schneier block and stuff. So um, I think the, the big lesson learned is yes, you know, it's a little tricky, but we showed you can build meaningful hardware trojans without adding a single Boolean function to that, right? So it's not an additional gate we added to that, right? We just manipulated existing storage element. Most of the detection techniques I think we think are quite stupid that people are working on because you can build really sneaky Trojans. And we're not NSA. This is the first time we're doing that, right? If, if, if you have a group at NSA or it's a German BND who is in business of doing that, they, 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 might have, they might be more creative than we are here, right? This built-in self-test you have to be careful with. Um, yeah, and the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the full paper uh, appeared at just 2013. What is really nice is some people, particularly in the US, they don't like this work here that we're doing, right? They don't like this work that we're doing here, right? And of course, you know, we, when we, 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 other security people heard, heard that, right? Why do you do this hacking, right? But this is a great example because we published this in 2013, and the following year, just 2014, a group of Japan, we didn't know those people, right? They thought this is interesting, so they looked in how can we detect this, this, this doping concentration change, right? And of course, and we never claimed this is impossible, they showed with, you know, your run-of-the-mill uh, scanning electron microscope, you can, in fact, kind of color these different doping concentration. It's not easy, and it takes some time, but it can be done. And my personal opinion is, you know, without being a material scientist, you can probably improve further on that. So if you know this is an attack you're really worried about, probably you know people that are in, in semiconductor design can come up with more sophisticated design mechanisms. Okay. So now we go to the next case study, and they get shorter and shorter. Okay. So don't don't, don't worry. Okay. So the FPGA trojan. So um, what we're going to look at now are FPGAs. Are people roughly familiar with FPGAs? FPGAs are field programmable gate areas. They're programmable hardware. So there's some hybrid between software and hardware. They're essentially hardware devices. And the two market leaders, Xilinx and Altera, they share about 90% of the world market. So it's an oli oligopole. Um, and they're, in they're used for all kinds of applications, in particular mission critical type of stuff and infrastructure, right? For a long time, Cisco was the biggest customer for Xilinx. So there was, a co was the company worldwide that used the most. FPGAs, and it's not going away. The opposite, I don't know, the, the hardware people in this room, right? About two years ago, 
Intel bought one of the two market leaders, right? And there's, there's, there's a background in that, um, generally speaking, hardware is more, way more in energy efficient than software solutions. And if you talk about applications such as deep learning, you get a huge mm -hmm. advantage set. So there's a big push also. We work with Intel. They want to start down the road. They want every Intel chip will have an FPGA attached on chip, this conjunction. So FPGA, what I'm trying to say, FPGAs are not going away. It's not some kind of odd stuff. My first NSF grant in 97 was also crypto on FPGAs. This is not going away. It's probably becoming more important in, in the years to come. And it has to do with energy efficiency, I guess. So how do they work? And there's some kind of, the, the, the basic idea is if you buy them, you know, Amazon or eBay or, you know, favorite electronic supplier, they're done, right? You have, think about them, you have about one million gates there without any functionality. The functionality you have to program in, how do we do that? Well, you have a bitstream file. You have a bitstream, you know, about something like 10 million bits that configure your transistor configuration here. Um, and for technological, it's almost like, it's, it's more than an artifact. It's like for technological reasons, you would think that you put this bit file, right, this program information, on chip, but for technological reasons, you cannot do that. It's always off chip, it's on the motherboard. You need to have a flash memory, which is on your motherboard. How do you get it in? <coughs> Literally during power up. You know, yeah, it takes whatever, 8.8 .8 seconds to load in the chip, and then your hardware is configured, and it works like a Cisco net, net, network home, okay? So, now let's look what we, you know, if you're the bad guys, right, let's look if, if, if you want to have your AES accelerator here for SSL or IPsec, you program AES somehow in your bitstream and then, of course, AES shows up in, in your FPGA and in your, your network router uses AES. So, what Pavel and I asked ourselves a few years ago, can we build hardware trojans by manipulating the bitstream? And in methodology, which methodological terms, this is much nicer than the Intel attack because we can do that in the lab, right? The Intel attack we didn't do ourselves, right? Intel hates us for what I showed you before, right? They will not allow us to manipulate the, sh the chips. This we can do in the lab, right? So, okay, so what is this, you know, high level principle? It's very simple. So. We have a design that had AS, and our goal is to manipulate AS. So what we do, we somehow manipulate bits, right? So two bits are flipped. In practice, there are a few more bits. And then you configure not the original bit stream, but the manipulated bit stream. Surprise, surprise. Meaning, if you manipulate it, bits here, we're not uploading, the, we're not configuring the original AS, but AST for Trojan, right? So Trojanized AS. This is easy, but how do you do that in the real world? This is engineering now, right? So what are the mechanics of FPGAs? And there, there, there are two things that make this, this attack in, in practice really, really hard. So you have a given design with AS inside, but there are two things that make it hard. First of all, they tend to be big, right? This is order of magnitude about one million the big FPGA logic cells, which is just, you know, size, but even harder is this bit stream is very complex and totally proprietary, and Xilinx threatens to sue everybody who starts reverse engineering that baby. So it's kind of a touchy issue. So the challenges that we have is first find AES in an unknown design here. You know, this is, again, you have a Cisco router, somewhere there's an AES, you want to manipulate your AES core. And once you do that, how do we manipulate that? Okay. So, and this is very lucky, kind of, if you have a, have a symmetric cryptography background, there's some, sometimes you're lucky, right? Because in, in cryptography, there's some very specific components, right? In particular, in symmetric cryptography, these S-boxes are very, very specific. Anybody here from Sellers Group, symmetric crypto? You need this high nonlinearity, right? And this, then if, if, if you look at the actual table contents of your S-boxes, the totally pathological, right? You, you need this high nonlinearity. You will not need for any other digital designs. This is only occur. This is not occurring in the wild. It's only occurring in AS, right? So, meaning the S box contents is super specific to AS. There's no. You, you will not need that in like an MP3 decoder or in a soft core, whatever else you, you you're going to use the FPGA for. If you have this, if you have this contents of an S box, this is going to be AS, right? Then luckily, 
in general, this is really hard to decode, with one exception, there's small lookup tables in here, and they're easy to spot. Why is it just depends on the form? You're just looking at the format of your bitstream and these small lookup tables, they're easy to spot, right? Um, and then, so what we did, we looked at the lookup tables, they were pretty easy to find. I mean, pretty easy to find means six months of graduate student research here, right? You know, the kind of nitty gritty, low level, blah, 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 playing with the design tools, but it, it can be done, right? And you, you don't need a PhD in, in number theory or machine learning or whatever to do that, right? So, um, and so we, we found the rules how to look for S boxes, and what we did, we actually took eight different real world AES implementations from the internet, and what, the only thing that's important to you is here on the right hand side, we had a 100% detection rate. And again, if, if, if you know a little bit about block ciphers work and how hardware implementation of block ciphers work, this is not surprising because the S, S boxes are super, super specific. So now we do what Kenny nicely called an algorithmic substitution attack, but in a very simple and stupid way, right? Namely, we wanted to keep it simple here, um, meaning what we do is we're replacing the original S boxes with weak S boxes, right? Just the identity. And instead of this high nonlinearity, you know, robust, robustness against differential curves and blah, 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 we just program the S boxes so that they're the identity, right? So we inject weak S boxes in our memory, and if we do that, this not the original AES, but the Trojanized version of AES is being configured, so we get this AEST out of here, right? And now what you can do as an attacker, of course, you can feed plain text in your target device, and you get cipher text out, but it's, it's not the original cipher text with AES, but again, it's this you know, wonky, weakened AES implementation that you get out. Of course, this is kind of cute, but you know, by the way, this ciphertext is not the original AES ciphertext that you work, it's not interoperable. So this is not going to work in your SSL section. So the que but the attack is very simple, right? Because it's easy to find the S boxes, it's easy, easy to set them to the identity. So the question we ask ourselves, is there any value to that from an attacker's point of view? We think yes. There's one in one attack scenario, which is arguably probably the, mo the, the, the more scary one, namely storage encryption. In storage encryption, you know, you don't have Alice and Bob, you just have Alice, right? Alice is writing something to the storage unit and reading back from the storage unit. And typically using the same AES implementation, right? Running through the AM algorithm. So what you can do with this attack, this is, I think, totally legitimate from an intelligence agency point of view, you manipulate your asymmetric encryption unit such that the encryption becomes very, very weak. And by the way, you know, the details, how we manipulate the S box, you don't have to tell anybody. So from anybody, including the cloud provider, this would look like a strong encryption is taking place, right? And now if the intelligence agency gets access to, you know, the petabytes of stored cipher text, they can easily break that. So that's a possible <coughs> attack here, because you just encrypt with a weak crypto algorithm. Um, Storing. And, and yeah, by the way, if you do reading, if you read your encrypted uh, uh, ciphertext out, you're using the same Trojanized version of your AS, and you get the original cipher, uh, plain text out. The other attack, which is a little bit more complicated, but it's still interesting because this is stuff we typically do, it's key extraction. So here you have more, you have this attack scenario, you have your, I don't have a network router with me, you have your network router here, and you get access to that for an hour, right? Spies, right? The American, right? who's watching the Americans on Netflix, right? This type of, you get access to the network router. Your task is extracting the key. Very classical task, right? Embedded device, target device, you have access to a limited amount of time, you want to extract the key. Maybe the key is hard coded, maybe the key is generated by a path, by a physical and clonal function, some other means. So, what we can do with here is actually quite, I think it's quite elegant. So somehow there's a key, right? You don't have this key. And this key is hard-coded in your design. So what you can do, exactly what we propose here. You inject weak s box you open up your, your network router. You inject the weak um, AS Trojan, you feed it ciphertext, you get uh, plain text, you get ciphertext out, and now what you do, you break AES by going after the key, right? And if, you know, if, if the s boxes are weak enough, it can be done, right? Once you have the key, you go back and you configure the original S boxes again. 
So this is a key extraction attack. This is much easier than the side channel attacks, what we typically do, right? This is an elegant way, if you have access to a target device, to extract the key without any kind of complex physical or mathematical cryptanalysis. So what's the conclusion about this attack? I mentioned that before 1997, I got, I was very proud, I got my NSF career award on FPGA, crypto and FPGAs, right? And it's not me alone, there are hundreds and hundreds, the whole chess community, you know, they always use FPGAs for the crypto implementation stuff, blah, 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 blah. Nobody ever looked at this as an attack vector, right? N n nobody thought about what happens if you start manipulating the bitstream. You know, we were kind of, including myself, for 20 years, I was kind of stuck in my, you know, tunnel blix, they say, you know, you kind of, you only have this one view on FPGA, so this is a new attack vector, I think it's scary. Um, the nice thing is, you can do that in your lab, so it's great for, for, for um, grad students to do that stuff. Um, in order to counter that, you know, when I see people looking critically, which is great, right? This should not be, we shouldn't be able to do that, right? You should protect the bitstream, right? One crypto person, when I gave the talk last year, said, of course the bitstream is malleable, right? This is what we're doing here, right? Within limits, right? And there's bitstream available, both by Xilinx and Altera. The problem is we broke all the bitstream protection algorithms. That's the thing, by essentially running side channel attacks here. So the, the, the bitstream protection that's available on the markets, this is not terribly secure right now. Down the roads, it will probably be available. Right now, it's not. The details are at an um, uh, IEEE TCAT uh, paper by um, uh, Pavel and, and um, other people from my group here. Okay. So. The last topic for today is, is actually the shortest uh, topic where we, um, it's not strictly a hardware Trojan type of attack, but still a very surprising type of hardware attack. And I, I uh, really like that here. Okay, it's a key extraction attack. Okay. So what we figured out here, if you start manipulating the bit stream, right, that means the software, the bits that configure the hardware, some kind of unexpected stuff happen, right? So, and we, so we were wondering, can we use this fiddling around with the bitstream for extracting keys, but without implementing for Trojans? And this is purely experimental work, and it's really surprising. So it's unfortunately a little bit complicated what I have to explain. Uh, but maybe, again, for the, the crypto people, particularly the symmetric crypto people, what is our setup? The classical setup is you have your AS, you want to go after the key. Right. So what do you have available? You have plain text and cipher text. You don't know the key. This is Alan Turing breaking the enigma, right? 1943, right? This is very classical symmetric uh, uh, cryptanalysis setting. We still have that now in our setting, but we have an additional degree of freedom. We can manipulate these bits here. That means we can manipulate AS, but to make things harder, we don't have full control. If you have full control, it's easy. You just build a key leakage circuit, right? You could just build with your digital hardware circuits that before you send out the ciphertext, you leak out the key. It's hard. It's much harder with some kind of random manipulation because we don't really know the semantic of this bit, right? So that would be equivalent. Alan Turing was able to randomly mess up the Enigma machine of the Germans, right? There's this ro the rotor setting was magically somehow you could do that, right? It's, so it's kind of a weird setting. Can we use it? So the question is, can we manipulate the bitstream, but with an unknown design, again, meaning we don't know the meaning of the bit, we don't have the semantically, we don't know what these individual bits mean with respect to the AS ar architecture, such that we get access to the key. And this is now weird experimental work, and I'm super impressed that Pavel pulled that off, right? So. It's, we, we call it that bitstream fault injection or beefy attack. Um, so what do we do? So if you look inside in this bitstream, you have, you have uh, two or three different types of elements. In particular, you have these lookup tables, right? And in most modern FPGAs, they have six bit input, one put output, and you configure them. In these logic tables, they are realizing your Boolean function, meaning there is no explicit X or AND gate. Everything you want to do with Boolean function, you do by programming these small lookup tables, and there are a few 10,000 available in the large FPGAs. Here is the attack algorithm. Surprising, right? So, and again, they're easy to, they're easy to spot. We don't know the meaning of that, but they're easy to spot. We see all 30,000 of them. So we go after the first lookup table, 
and we manipulate them, uh, we, manipulate them we manipulate it by setting all bits to zero, for instance, right? Whatever Boolean function is in, we don't know, we set them to zero, right? You know, red, red flash, okay? Then we configure the FPGA, meaning we upload the bit stream that takes, takes two or three seconds here, right? And then we send the plain text to that, so far so good. And then we carefully look at the, at the cipher text, and now it's a weird thing. We're checking whether the cipher text contains the key, which is some kind of a weird thing, right? And we want to talk about that in a minute, what does that mean? Probably we don't succeed with the first lookup table, so what do we do? We, do this, we, we set this to uh, its original value and we zeroize the second lookup table. So with, with the second lookup table, the third lookup table, and so forth. And again, there's a finite, finite number of lookup tables, a few 10,000 available, right? So um, why would that leak? Or how does it leak? Let's start with that. How does it leak? Well, the easiest thing <coughs> is that the cipher text directly contains a ground key, right? What we also found, sometimes you have the inverted round key, sometimes the cipher text is the plain text x out with a round key. There are a whole bunch of different things, sometimes you get half of the key out. This has to do how the AES architecture looks inside. So we checked, you know, we came up with some kind of hypothesis, we checked this here, right? What kind of manipulations can we do? Like the, the, the most basic one is setting all zero. We also try all one, you can invert, and sometimes you just manipulating the upper half of your lookup table and you leave the lower half intact and so forth. What are the results? The results are really interesting. So we looked at 16 unknown, unknown designs, so they were not designs coming from us, we found them on the internet. We came up with 16 different manipulation rules, manipulation rules. Um, the designs that we looked at had about 20,000 lookup tables here, and it takes about three seconds to um, manipulate a lookup table, and actually not the manipulation, but this uploading, you know, this is macroscopic time scale, right? It takes three seconds to upload that and configure that, right? So the result is there were 16 unknown AES designs, every single design leaks the AES, which has kind of surprised us, right? On average, it, it took us 2,000 uploads here, meaning it's not only one lookup table, there's typically several lookup tables we have to manipulate. And the scary thing is we also looked at uh, one implementation with an encrypted bit stream, it still worked. Okay. It seems kind of black magic, but it, it, the world is not that complicated, in, in, at least in the hardware world. So what often happened, you know how AS works, right? AS is a round-based algorithm, so you have 10 rounds, and somewhere you have a few gates that are in charge of being the round counter, right? You count one, two, three, four, five, and by 10 you output that. If you hit the right lookup table that's in charge of the round counter, you get the output after one round, after zero rounds. And then, you know, the, the cipher text immediately was the key. This is what's happening. And that's, you know, it's, it's part of PhD thesis, right? If you're bored, you can gladly, he really, he really looked into that, what, what's happening inside the, these architectures here. What is the conclusion? Well, it's a, you know, if, if, if you know the chess community, we would call that a false attack, right? And it's kind of a weird false attack because we fiddle around with the software configuration of our hardware. Um, and again, this can be called malleability, right? Malleability of the bitstream, it's a major weakness, so we, we really have to take care of that. And we, we're talking to Intel right now, and remember, Intel bought Altera, so they're worried about that stuff. They, they, their conclusion is we have to protect the bitstream in a, in a really strong way. Um, I don't think this is the only thing you can do. I assume there's stronger attacks, of, uh, maybe not stronger, but there are other attacks available. And um, uh, we just had a, a IEEE ETC article published um, in March 2018 on that. <coughs> I think one final slide, which is not research. So if you enjoy this type of stuff, please come to Amsterdam. You know, the CHESS, which is our big conference in our field, Cryptographic Hardware and Embedded System, will be in, in mid-September. Um, another advertisement is a, a not very academic uh, event, is ESCA, Embedded Security in Cars, which is a conference we started also about 15 years ago, which will be in Brussels this year. About 300 people, 90% are from industry, so you don't get researchy type of thing, but they're looking, you know, fuzzing off the canvas, this type of thing, really uh, 
what are the new upcoming EU standards for car-to-car -car communications, this type of thing. I think it's really a fun conference. It's really driven by uh, the people in the automotive field. I think it's quite interesting. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>